Hello, I'm Michael Redman, professional Go player. In this video, I'm going to show you a game I played in March, a tournament game, in the Kiriyama Cup. And this game has a time control of one hour each, uh, with a uh, 30 second overtime. At first, I'll be talking about a fight, the first fight in the game. And that will be um, in my opponent's sphere of influence. And after that, um, a lot of the focus is on a code that just stays there and sort of lasts throughout most of the middle game. And so I think those codes are probably difficult for some people to understand. And to be frank, uh, both of the players, both myself and my opponent, slightly mishandled it. So it's difficult for everyone. So I have the black stones in this game. And this is a very common opening nowadays. And actually, this is an interesting point. Before we had AIs, I think that the next move would be, quite often it would be splitting the side like this. And this is just a move that AIs do not like. They don't give it a very good score. Even at that, at, before we had um, AIs, people would be thinking of playing an approach move such as this. This would be a very normal move for black to play. And also an extension here would be considered a big move. Um, after we have AIs, um, pretty obviously jumping into the through three points has become very common. So both of these moves will be getting good scores from AIs. And interesting enough, this move still gets a pretty good score. So I, I'd say that nowadays people have a choice from one of these three moves. I've seen people experiment with approach moves on the inside of White's uh, position, but these are not as, as popular as actually this one gets a better score and it's the more popular move as far as humans are consumed also if black plays this way white will probably kick and jump and we get into this kind of thing after this uh the ai forecast you might say is it gets a bit crazy you might see white playing moves like this and it seems to be uh one of the possibilities as far as ais are concerned Quite often we see attachments like this with an AI. Extending here um, was a move that some human players would play. I mean, I'm talking about top professionals, of course, um, but it uh, it's slightly lower than the other three moves that I was showing. One thing that hasn't changed is that playing from this side, um, it gets a low score from computers also. And it's a move that uh, human players would consider bad because black already has a strong position in the upper right corner. So this position is really strong. It also happens to be low. So black's down on the third line. That means that when it's both strong and low, for one thing, white playing anything on the right side will not have much effect on black. So that reduces the value of the right side. Also, the fact that black is low means that black will not be able to make a kind of a vertical uh, moyo, uh, a territorial structure that reaches out into the center making that will be relatively difficult for black. And so black doesn't have so much potential on the right side either. So this is the one one move, you might say, that was um, considered bad by humans before we had AIs, and it's still bad even when we um, judge it with AIs. So that's probably the most important thing for uh, Q players and such to, to, to know. In the game I played here, and white covered on this side. This is sort of the natural way for white to um, enlarge the lower side of the board. And black slided. So when black slides there, that cools down the, the lower right corner and white can play away. If I had curled here, which is um, also feasible, if I had curled, white probably would have at least hunted once. And maybe we would see white playing some kind of a Joseki like this or white could play away at this point. In the game, I played the knight's move. That means that white doesn't have to continue locally, and white played here. Um, playing the, uh, Splitting the side like this is still considered a good move. This is the move to play in this position. And black can extend on one side or the other. So sometimes this actually works. In this position where white has already played a lot of key points on the lower side, it's still a good move for black. And it's a lot easier to use than some of the moves like, sometimes you will see AIs telling you to play moves like this in a similar position. 
And it's just so much more difficult to make this work when white can pinch around the other side and you have to escape towards the center. It's, it can be a bit difficult for black. So if white plays on the left, I'm going to extend here. And this would actually uh, prepare to attack white on the right there. White's wall does not have two eyes. And in the game, white played from the right side. So I think this is correct. And I played a two-space extension. Um, I could have done a three-space extension. Um, and white would probably invade. It would get a bit, uh, a bit messy there. I played the two-space extension. And I attached here. So this is a position where black could have played away, but it would allow white to make a very severe attack on the black zones on the lower side. So my advice would be that, in general, it's a good idea to add a stone to this. Adding a stone like this would be another way that would be relatively easy for black to do, um, although it would not be forcing. So my idea with the attachment here is that if white answers on this side, I'll pull back. And in this case, I have a cut here, which gives me a forcing move here, um, which I don't have to play yet. In fact, it's not forcing if I play it right now, but if, when I become under attack, I can always play that forcing move on the second line. And it means my group on the lower side is a bit more sick. So I could continue with something, for instance, on, on the right side. I mean, I could continue on the upper side, maybe after reinforcing my group on the lower side like this. So that was my plan. In the game, white uh, plays once here, and locally this is a slight gain for black, but white was setting up to play this bit. So um, already we're in a big fight here. And it is in an area where white has a local advantage, so I have to be really careful about how I handle this. So when this happens, you will see me with some ideas that I might be sacrificing some stones. It sort of depends. Uh, white pulled back. This is a very solid move. If white had left it, for instance, then I would be able to play here and here. And this would capture two white stones on the lower side. So if white cuts here and takes, then I get to capture two stones. Or if white connects on the left, I can connect under. So that would be um, bad for white. In this case, the tombstone density, the, I, the stone pillar is what they call it. It doesn't work quite, because at this point white has no way of filling my liberty. So this one is not working quite. So to go back to the game variation, white did need somehow to add a move. White could have done it this way, but it would have been a bit more tricky because I still have some potential to play like this and cut and play here and here. So it's it's not certain whether this is going to work immediately or not, but there is this um, attack that black can potentially hope to do. So white played very solidly with this move. I think it's it seems reasonable. And I played here. And this is a move I really um, had trouble deciding. It turns out that I think I should have played here now. And I was worried about the fact that later on, white can peep it here. In, in some cases, this is going to be a problem. So for instance, if we assume that white um, saves these stones in the center first and then plays here, if black plays here, white can push through here and cut the one black stone off. Otherwise, if black saves the one stone, it's bad on the lower side. So it's bad for black in either case. And so most of my time was spent on trying to see, find a way that I could solve this. And I wasn't really satisfied. So going back to the game, what I did was I played this jump. So I was, I was avoiding that, that issue. Uh, but I could have played here and then played here. And this kick actually does solve the problem pretty well. So in this case, if white plays here, I can always bump against white here. And this would be no problem. So I would be able to handle it with the bump at seven being a forcing move, uh, threatening to capture the white stones. I was threatening to capture these three white stones on the right with that move. 
So six is not going to uh, continue to be a problem. In some cases, I can just sacrifice these four stones on the right if I gain something on the left first. So that's something that um, when researching the game with Katago, it turned out that was probably the better move. In this case, white does get an extra forcing move there and is starting to attack me in the center. So it was at this point, or actually earlier, but it was this point where I made the final decision that I was willing to sacrifice these four stones. I'm talking about these four stones here. I'm, I'm going to try to sacrifice them. Actually, my opponent refuses to take it in the game. Um, but sort of pushing out here would be a little bit painful. So white might play this one first, but um, the whole sequence where I have to try to escape here, it's going to be a bit, a bit painful. So I didn't like that variation. In the game, I push through and cut. So the idea with this move is that if white plays something like this to capture the black stones, I can squeeze from this side. So in this race to capture, I'm already losing by one move. Uh, for instance, if white plays something on the upper side, um, locally, if I play like this, white now has three liberties and I am down to two. So white will win, uh, win by one liberty. Uh, but it's okay because I, I do have this big move on the left. And actually, I'm not going to play that exchange yet, because sometimes I'm going to be able to play a honey here, threatening a ladder, and white has to answer it like this. And I cannot escape, but I can sometimes use the forcing move here. So sometimes it's better for me to use this forcing move, which will give me a kind of a squeeze here um, towards the center. And various moves um, will work there. For instance, if black connects, at this point. Then white will have to fill a liberty in order to be still, this would still be a one move victory for white here in the in the center. But that means that if I can capture those two stones, it's going to save the whole group. So basically anything in this area is going to be forcing because black can capture the two white stones. So there's Samaji towards the center, as well as the fact that I can squeeze on the left. And I felt that that was going to be okay for me. So going back to the game, my opponent actually did not try to capture those five black stones. And is going to improve his group in the center, and is hoping to squeeze me a little bit more on the lower side. And we'll see how that worked out. Uh, this was a point where I played the safe move, capturing in a ladder, um, but I didn't have to do that. This is actually something my opponent um, made this point immediately after the game, and it turns out that Kadago agreed with him. So um, that was... A point for him. Um, I should have just extended in center. Extending straight out into the center and reducing white's potential towards the upper side was more important than actually capturing that one white stone, which was a ladder after all. In the game I was giving white the ladder breaking move also. So in this case white would be able to squeeze like that, but it would not be realistic for white to actually have tried to save the one stone, the cutting stone. So this I could have lived with this. Um, and on the lower side, when white bumps against me, if I answer at 13, um, keeping my space on the lower side, I'm pretty much alive. It's going to be very difficult for white to kill that black root. So this would be very, um, it would be good for me. It would have been perfectly playable. Going back to the game, I did not extend, but took in a ladder. So white's going to have a, a ladder breaking move somewhere on the right there. And on the lower side, you see I bumped against the side. I'm trying to play more actively, but this is actually, it's um, locally, it's not a living shape. Actually, if white locally plays here and here, uh, this is going to be, locally, it's going to be a dead shape. So this is, this actually resembles a life and death problem I put up. I think it was life and death 134 or something like that. I'll put a li link in the description. Very similar to that shape. So black is not 100% alive on the side, whereas it would have been pretty much alive if I had played here. So that was a slight mistake I did on the lower side. Um, although it's not actually going to kill the black group, it did uh, change the status a little bit. We'll see that being a kind of an issue later in the game. 
And here white moves out to the right side, and the latter still favors black, but the moment I do something like this, uh, now the latter is not going to work. So if I play that exchange, then white will have this, this move here. And um, this would be pretty bad for me. It would be a disaster. In this shape, I cannot afford to sacrifice those five stones. So I start with this. This is looking at the 3-3 point. So if white just plays away, I can always push through and play the 3-3 point and take away white's corner territory. So that was the, um, the threat there. And white had a number of ways to answer, but chose to answer this way. So you can see white is just taking one step uh, uh, to taking away my eye space. With this move at E2, white has actually uh, finished taking away my eye space. And that's um, provided white pushes through at H4 once, that's going to be a dead shape. So we continue like this. White has uh, established a territory in the lower left corner. That's a fairly sizable territory that's close to 20 points. And the rest of the board is pretty undecided. I do have a 15 point territory in the upper right. And elsewhere I have various positions that look like they're going to be territories. While white also has something on the upper side. I'd say it's pretty, pretty balanced. And there was this move. It seemed such a natural move. Um, but there was a problem with this. And basically the problem is that it doesn't, um, it doesn't fix the issue of the ladder. Um, so I'm talking about the ladder with this stone. And white can still escape that, provided the ladder becomes favorable for white. And so this was a good point for me to take away the threat of the ladder. And I could have done that by starting with this move. And this is generally answered here, although white could take the coat, it would be a small difference. And then, now the ladder is good for white, and I would answer it with this move, which is creating a net, a getta. So if white escapes now, it's going to be a net like that. So that would solve all my troubles, and it would also give me an advantage towards the center. And white would probably still, obviously white would not try to escape here, but white would probably still play a move to reinforce this white group in the center. And black three would still be sort of leaning on white there. And so it would be the same thing, probably continue something like this, and then I could play away. So I could play something like this, for instance. This is the kind of move that I would play. You might see some players do stuff like this. This, this is also conceivable. And it would make it a lot easier for me to handle that group in the center if I didn't have to worry about that, that net, the ladder there. It's a net now. In the game, I played the diagonal move, and you see white did push through here. This is already locally, it's a dead shape. And I'm connected there, and white, with this move, white is pretty much alive in the center. And I have a potential eye here, and I'm sort of out. So this black group is okay for the time being. I, ha I have an eye here. Um, I don't really have any good way to make it into two eyes. Um, if I did find a way, it would be very painful anyway. So, for instance, I'm talking about moves like this, and then moves like this, for instance. Living like this is going to be very painful. I'm, I'm not really considering it as a, as a real option. So, um, if we assume black plays here, though, then this is a position where white can play like this. And if black plays here, then white is going to win the semi. So this is a, a pretty common um, tesuji here, where white can take away white black's eye space. So there is that threat, but I do have one eye on the lower side and a potential eye here. So for the time being, this black group is not in any real danger. And I play the extension on the upper side. So the real problem is that this, blue, this black group in the center I still have to be careful about that ladder thing, and it's not it doesn't have two eyes either. So this black group is a potential problem. There's also the fact that on the right here, we have this ko. This ko is a potential problem too, and white takes it now. So locally, if I answer here, then everything is safe. But it is just a little bit painful to be giving that exchange to white. And you can see that because of the fact that I am not resolving the problem of the ladder here, 
I I'm sort of given up the option of playing this move because now it would be Gota and I would have to add a stone to protect the center. So it would cost me one tempo, it would cost me a move, and white would be playing this six inch on the other side. So uh, that's how this this was sort of um, wasting, almost wasting a tempo in this in this variation. It would be better if I could combine these two stones into the bamboo joint that I was showing here. In this case, I've used two moves to do the same thing, and white got the upper side in return. So that's what the problem was here. And white takes the call. So um, in this game, we have only one hour. Uh, we're playing relatively quickly when most of the Japanese games give you three hours apiece. So um, I didn't really calculate too deeply, but in this kind of call, you do have to be careful um, because of the potential of white cutting on the second line. So this is the move to be afraid of. And that's because if white plays, let's just take a random move. Where did black play? Uh, in the game, black played here. Uh, this was actually a call threat. So let's say black plays uh, something somewhere else, uh, maybe something like this. Um, if white plays here, it's going to be a call also. But when white finally wins the call, for instance, like this, um, the black group in the corner is not dead yet. So locally, black could live by playing here, for instance, and would have enough room to live, or could even connect the one stone, and that would usually be alive also. So it's not a problem. Um, it's not a big problem, anyway. Whereas when white cuts on the inside, now this ko will kill the whole thing. So if white has enough ko threats, uh, white 4 would not, not actually be a forcing move, but if white can win the ko, this will capture the whole corner and would, similar, would still have potential towards the right side also. So this is the ko I have to be careful of, and I have to have a lead in ko threats always. So uh, that's, that's what makes this ko threat so difficult when I don't want to back off When I don't want to really back off at this point, it would be a bit painful, but I can't afford to lose the ko either. And so I played a ko threat here and took back. White plays a ko threat. At this point, the ko is not yet a, a really serious ko for either side, but it's going to get to be more, more complicated. In the game, I just scooped out white's territory on the side and I am building up the upper left corner. This upper left corner being a large corner enclosure, I'm talking about this stone. If this stone were, for instance, at C15 here, uh, the whole corner would be considered black's territory, probably. But when it's high like this and wide, the corner is not yet 100%. So white uh, immediately came and tried this and cut once. And if I try to kill the corner, um, for instance, if I do something like this, then white's going to get something on the outside. So basically, that's the that's the plan here that white has. I just took the one stone. So this is actually, it's, it's sort of like a ladder. Um, if white escapes here, I can capture it like that. So it's, it's not exactly a ladder, but it's close enough. So what white is... Um, thinking of doing here is, is going to be one of these um, Ataris on the second line. For instance, white can play like this to make a living shape. So this is the very least that white can do. Otherwise, white might be um, thinking of playing stuff like this and somehow making a ko out, out of it. Sometimes the ko move will work, although it's a bit dangerous for white also. It depends on ko threats sometimes or the surrounding stones. And white plays here to attack black. Um, but this was actually an opportunity for white to start the ko, because white has created a ko threat here in the upper left corner, that Atari that I was talking about. That's a useful move that can be used as a ko threat. So white could have cut here with this timing. This was a timing where white had an opportunity to cut. And all of my problems were caused by the fact that um, it, it goes back to this diagonal move that I talked about earlier, which was not resolving the problem of ladder, and I I lost the opportunity to play a, an Atari here, which would have reduced the value of the ko. And also the fact that I played here, which sort of naturally led to this sequence, 
where white is getting some cool threats in the upper left corner. All of this combined to make this the perfect timing for white to play the call. And if black, white has a cool threat here. So this is threatening to capture black on the lower side, or it would cutting the black groups would put the black group in the on the left in trouble also. So that would be bad. But black also had a cold threat there. And white has this cold threat. So this, this cold threat that white has actually manufactured in the upper left corner is going to be decisive. Because now black doesn't really have a good cold threat. Uh, looking at the center white group, that group, there's no way really to kill it with just two moves. Uh, it still sort of has some space there in the center. So it's going to be difficult for me to accomplish anything with that. Uh, white's corner, um, I could play an Atari at e4, but that would just be a ko and it would not outright kill the corner. So that would not be very satisfactory. Pushing through at c8 is also a small ko threat. Maybe I'll play something towards the white group in, on the upper side, but this ko is so big that this would actually be a success for white. White would kill the whole corner, and um, I would get something on the upper side, but it would not be enough. So this is was a chance for white to start the call. And it's an example of how these calls, although they start slow, they're very dangerous. You, you have to look at a, the perfect timing to start the call for, for white. Also, black had to be a bit more careful about that. So that's where I messed up, but I, I guess I was lucky. And my opponent did not do that. So he's um, putting pressure on my group in the center. And I take back the call. So there's a very... It's a very dangerous balance here, where I'm, I need to protect the ko, and I also have to worry about my group in the center. I do have a slight lead in territory, but it's not big enough um, for, for me to be feeling safe here. And you can see my opponent is seems to think that he can catch up just by playing big moves. So these two moves that White has played in the center, uh, this move and this move, they're big moves because they are reinforcing White's group on the upper side. And um, I did take away white space with this move, so there's some reason for white to reinforce it. Making some territory in the center of the board. Uh, white basically is trying to catch up in territory just using the potential of that call, um, when he could have actually played the call out. This is actually the more common way to make use of that call, but white um, lost a chance there. And I got to play this reinforcing move in the center. And at this point, it was a bit more ambiguous because I have a co threat here, which could be pretty effective. So white did not play the co in this case, but actually just went for the corner territory. So this was this actually made it easy for me because white is just taking some territory in the corner. I think at this point, um, the game is either very close or maybe a slight advantage for black. It seems that I've um, I'm sort of out of the woods at this point. And there's still a coder at um, S7, but since white has invested a move in the corner by connecting at this point, it means that um, playing some moves. So for instance, if at some point white, uh, let's just have black play a move like this. If at some point white takes here, um, I would probably answer it on this side, um, getting something back on the right side, and it would still be this call. So, it's taking white a lot of time to realize some profit out of this coin in this case, just because white has already invested one move in the corner here. And compared to the uh, the co in which white succeeded, that will be one extra move that it's costing white. So at this point, the co has become relatively small. And I still have to worry about the entire black group a little bit. I'm looking for a good time to surround the right side and fix that problem. But I'm going to start with a little attack here. So with this attack here, I've actually taken away white's eye space in the center. If white plays... So in the game, I continued with this. And yes, I'm reinforcing my group in the center and putting pressure on white's group in the center. If white plays here, I can take away white's eyes like this. And if white plays here, I still have the option of taking away white's eyes with this move, uh, like this. And it would be a dead shape. 
or if white plays on this side, I can play here to take away the other eye. So I do, white only has one eye there in the center. And white played here to escape. And so at this point, I got to play here. So at this point, we've sort of entered the end game. There's still some really big moves. And this capture in the upper left corner was one of them. So this was an opportunity for white to play here and play here. I think this would have kept the game fairly close. In the game, I felt that I had taken a territorial lead when I played this move. White is sort of trying to put pressure on my group on the lower side. I, um, the viewer might recall that I said that this, this shape is only one eye. If I just cover on the side like at F2, that's going to be a one eye shape. So I need one more eye, but I'm actually okay because in this position, I still have a potential eye in the center. In the game, I played here. So if white continues with this sequence, and white has to play the push through at three first, actually. But uh, if white continues with this sequence that will try to take away my eye space on the lower side, I can always play here and here. And white cannot get to this spot, because if white plays here, I just capture it. So in this variation, I'm going to get an eye here in the center with, well, something like this. It's, it's some similar variation like this will give me that eye there. Just because white cannot play at the 16 point. Just to go back a few moves and look at it in a different way. If white plays here, even if I play here, there's no way for white to take away the eye at this point. And when I play this move, this is the hanging connection that uh, finally saves this group of stones, which was not small. At this stage of the game, it's um, getting more and more valuable. Like it's close to 15 points if, I, if white does manage to capture it. And with this hanging connection here, I actually saved the group. So that was more or less finished all the big endgame moves. At this point, I seem to have a small, small lead. In the game, we play this sequence. I, I have to be careful about the eyes uh, of my group in general. So I'm playing, that's why I'm playing this move and bumping against here. So this creates eye space for my black group. And it also takes away the threat of white pushing in here and trying to cut me off. So that was uh, the reason for this move. So I'm perfectly alive now. I have an eye here and an eye here. And we're into an end game. So at this point, the black does seem to have a slight advantage. I have only one eye. I actually, this, um, this, the way white played this, um, I told you that white can uh, take away black's two eyes by playing here. When white plays this way, Obviously, it's uh, better as far as territory is concerned. It's a better endgame move, but it does not outright kill the black group. So even locally, now I can live with this move, which would give me... This would be a Seki, a living shape. So I'm actually alive. So I played here, and looks like I'm okay. And after this sequence, where white did not really gain very much, I actually do have um, a solid lead. So now I'll just run through the rest of the, the game moves. I think I ended up winning by four and a half points. And while I told you that the position here on the lower side was going to be a Seki, um, it turns out that Black can play this endgame move with Sente. So it's actually a black territory in actual play. And so no serious mistakes in the endgame. I think I... Um, I think it was evenly played. And with this, the game is over. Um, if I re uh, remember correctly, I won by four and a half points. So thank you for watching this game. I think the focus was on the original fight on the lower side and then the co on the right side. Those were the two important parts of this game. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, like it if you liked it and uh, sign up to my channel for more videos like this. Thank you.